Well, good evening. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to uh, what will no doubt be uh, a non-stop thrill ride through... Um, Are we already to the questions? <laughs> uh, are there any questions? I'm done at this point, and so I'll just take questions from here on out. For those of you at, who, who happen to be at the Lumen event in November, um, Dr. Alquist, who gave a talk on G.K. Chesterton, had given several other talks, uh, and he said, I'm, I'm done giving talks, so I'm just going to take questions. And uh, It was humorous at the time. I don't know if it's still humorous now. But in any case, I said it, and it's over, and we're moving on. So I do want to welcome you all to uh, this Advent series on prayer. Uh, hosted by the Church of the Resurrection. My name is Brian Fink. I'm the Director of Catholic Culture for the parish. I also teach uh, in the middle school, Religion and History. And Father Steve asked me if I'd be willing to give an introduction to the life of Christian prayer. And I was very honored by that, um, that invitation. And so we're going to spend three sessions, this Thursday, next Thursday, and the following, covering essentially the the catechism's content on prayer. And so the vast majority of what I will share during these sessions will not be anything original, which is probably a very good thing. In fact, it's, a, it's probably a very good thing. And it also means that whatever we cover, you'll be able to look back through the catechism. I'm, I'm actually planning to kind of go through in a sort of systematic way. Uh, what the content of the catechism contains. So you'll be able to go back through and, and look and, and see the, the deeper references and the, the scriptural references. And in the next sessions, if you'd like to bring your catechism with you, all, all the better. Uh, because it's not the book that you, obviously, that you pick up and, and read from start to finish. But, uh, but it's, it's, as Pope Benedict would say, it's the most important document that the church has ever produced, which is saying something. And not just for the content of the catechism, but for the thousands of references to the scriptures, to the writings of the church fathers, to the lives of the saints, to other apostolic and papal documents. Uh, it's, it's a wealth of uh, a treasure, really. So I think it would be apropos if we began in prayer and ask in a particular way that uh, that I don't waste your time. That's always what I, wor I always worry about that, you know. Not necessarily with my middle school students because they have to be there, but you guys are coming voluntarily. I don't want to waste their time, obviously, either. But that uh, the Holy Spirit will guide my words and uh, whatever you are here to receive, uh, you will do so in, in the, under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. So let's begin in prayer in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good and gracious God, we give you glory and praise. We worship you, we, we praise you, we adore you, we glorify you. Lord, we gather here today recognizing our smallness, our humanity. And as we anticipate the coming of your son at Christmas, and we welcome your son into our hearts each day, and as we look forward to and long for the coming of your Son at the end of time, help us, Lord, enter into this season of Advent, this looking forward to, this anticipation of what our real existence will be. Lord, I ask you to forgive us for the times that we fail to love you, the times that we have been selfish, the times that we have forgotten that you are our Father that you heal us, that you forgive us. We ask you to gather all of our prayers together uh, and as we unite them under the mantle of the Blessed Virgin Mary that she takes them to you and intercedes for all of us that we might imitate her in her yes, in her silent contemplation and anticipation of your Son. As we pray, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Saint Nicholas, pray for us. 
My daughter used to call St. Nicholas St. Nickius, and so that's what we call him at my house. I had a, a professor in the seminary, a Dominican priest, who taught probably the best courses uh, that I took while I was in the seminary. His name was Father Larry. And he used to always say, look, everything, and he, he, he was from Pennsylvania. I can't do a Pennsylvania accent, but I'm going to do one, and it's not going to sound like it's from Pennsylvania, but I want you to get the feel of it anyway. So you used to say, you know, it's, everything's foundations, everything. It's all foundations. If, so if you don't understand the foundations of anything, you're not going to understand anything about anything. And so if you don't understand the foundations, and so the entire semester would end up becoming the foundation of the thing that we were supposed to be studying. Everything that he taught, in effect, was foundational to what we were supposed to be, he, what, he, what he was supposed to be teaching. And what I discovered in my own teaching experience, which is not, not vast, but, but, but 10 or 15 years, is that so much of what we learn can be aided by or stifled by our understanding of foundations. And so when we consider the life of prayer, the life of Christian prayer, we have to recognize where prayer comes from. And that the church doesn't make up prayer out of thin air. That everything that a Christian does or ought to do in prayer has some foundational source. And then when we stray from that foundational source, we get ourselves into trouble. And so it's all foundations. And he used to say, Father Larry used to say, look, if you're not smart enough to understand the foundations, you're never going to understand the rest of this, so good luck with your life. He used to say things like that. Good luck with your life. Um, good luck with your hopes and dreams. He, whenever we had a test, he used to say, God, help us take this test and get on with our lives. Amen. <laughs> foundations. One of the essential foundations to understand when we begin to talk about prayer is that whenever you talk about anything in the church and the teachings of the faith, you end up having to talk about everything. Because there's no component of our faith, whether it be the liturgy, morality, the scriptures, the priesthood, the sacraments, the life of prayer, the life of the family, nothing is understood in isolation. In fact, the things only make sense when we think about them in the context of everything else. And I think this is why Father Larry always got caught up on foundations. Because you have to talk about everything to talk about something. So I hope, in a good way, this discussion doesn't feel isolated or, or narrowly focused on the life of prayer because everything is connected to everything, because ultimately everything is connected to God, and God is one. God is a unity in Trinity. So, when we talk about prayer, we're going to talk about the scriptures. We're going to talk about the life of the church. We're going to talk about the, litur the liturgy. We're going to talk about the moral life. Uh, we're going to talk about the, the communion of saints. We're going to talk about the Blessed Virgin Mary. And none of it should feel far away from the main point of our focus. So that's the reality of foundations. What should we expect? I'll give you just a little brief overview of, of what the next three weeks will look like. All right. So three talks. There are four chapters in the last section of the Catechism on Prayer. The first is on the revelation of prayer, so that will be the focus of tonight's talk. How prayer is, or the life of prayer is revealed to us, given to us by God, through creation, through the scriptures, through the life of the church. The second talk next week will be on the tradition of prayer, which will look at specifically the age of the church, or the life of the church, with regard to the liturgy, with regard to um, the, 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 the scriptural foundations, and with regard to the living out of the virtues, the way that we interact in our prayers with the Father and with the Son and with the Spirit.
It'll also touch on the way of prayer, so looking at examples of prayer, the lives of the saints, uh, how prayer exists in the family, uh, how prayer groups might uh, evolve. The third talk will be on specifically on different ways of prayer, the life of prayer, so meditation and contemplation and what those sort of prayer traditions look like throughout history. And it will help us in sort of our own individual prayer lives, understanding better how we learned how to pray and, and how we can grow in our, own, in our own prayer. So those are the three talks, roughly speaking. They'll probably all overlap a little bit, but I'll do my best to be on, on point and on target. So you, you should know just at the outset that I'm, I'm a teacher by trade. Uh, I'm not much of a lecturer, so uh, I might ask questions of the audience. Uh, if you have a question, please feel free to ask it. Uh, I want this to be much more didactic than, than um, just a guy droning on about something and on and on and on and everyone's starting to nod off, which is mostly my experience of teaching for the last 15 years with young people. The great thing about teaching adults is they want to be there, but you actually have to like say true things, you know what I mean? <laughs> Students, they don't know. You just have to be one, like one tiny step ahead of them. But adults, they're like, I know more than you, Fink, so uh, don't mess up. And that's kind of how I'm feeling right now, so I'll, I'll do my best not to blow it. This is being recorded. So I was telling uh, Dan Dowsett earlier, I said, the problem with being recorded is that you can't say anything heretical because it's there. Uh, and so I have to be careful. If I say anything heretical, I hope that you'll call me out on that. At the very outset, I will also say this about prayer. I am no expert. I am no master. I am a sinner just like all of you. I have tried to be faithful to daily prayer since I was about 20 years old, and I'll be 40 next year, and most of it has been mostly a disaster. The life of prayer is exactly that. It's a life of prayer. It's never perfected. It's never complete. And no matter where we are, the Lord is always calling us to something further, something deeper, something richer, something more intimate. So if you have never spent 10 minutes alone, in silence, in the church, in prayer before, that's okay. If you've been praying since you were a youth, since you were a little one, that's okay. The life of prayer is really at the heart a life of communion with the Trinity. And the problem is the Trinity is perfect, but we aren't. So we pray that our life of prayer is an ascent to the mountain of God, but there are peaks and valleys. So we always have to be conscientious of that. And, and also recognizing that, that all of us, for our own expertise and, and, and for our own shortcomings, we're all in this thing together. So keeping that in mind, uh, I have had an opportunity to speak about prayer a lot. Uh, I was in the seminary for five years, and so they forced us to pray, which is a good thing. Uh, they, forced, they forced us to pray a lot of different prayers and, and regularly, which was uh, probably part of the, uh, the, the, the reason, one of, one of the reasons my life was, was saved in a lot of ways. But we're all on, on a different stage in the journey. Thank you very much, Mr. Spaulding. Look at the magic rabbit I pulled out of my hat. That's cold. He's so gracious. <laughs> Thank you. Here's one other expectation that we'll say at the outset. None of us ought to believe that prayer will look something like this. All right. I'm going to get in there, I'm going to sit down, I'm going to kneel in front of Jesus, and some amazing things are going to happen, and I'm going to have this powerful experience, and my life's going to be transformed, and I'm going to get in there, and then I'm going to get out of there and get on with my life, and things are going to go great. No. We are beggars before the Lord. That's what Augustine calls himself and everyone else by implication. We're beggars. When we go to pray, we're on God's turf. We're on God's time. And that's a tough reality to swallow. That's a tough pill. Thankfully, 
God made us in his image and likeness, and he built us for communion with himself. So there's great hope. But simply to will communion with God is a kind of arrogant, farcical joke. But prayer is awesome at the same time. So don't be, don't be discouraged, but, but we have to have that, that disposition. And the catechism over and over and over and over will repeat that our disposition in prayer must always be one of Humility. That no matter how long we've been living a life of prayer, even if we've been free of sin for decades, that we are humble <laughs> beggars before the Lord. That's who we are. But what a great grace at the same time. Because we can then, with, with Therese, say, I'm just, I'm just a child. I'm, I'm just a child grasping, grasping for the hem of my mother's dress as I am to the Lord. And that's okay. So, there we are. A little bit of the foundations, okay? So let's launch into this thing because I'm already 30 minutes in and I haven't even said anything about See, this is exactly what Father Larry did. So it's all his fault. You can blame him. I'll send you his email address later. Okay. <laughs> Beginning at 2558 of the Catechism, I'm not going to reference the numbers to the Catechism often, but I do want you to understand that I'm not making this stuff up. So I am going to make some references on a fairly regular basis. To begin, the introduction to the Catechism on Prayer says, Great is the mystery of faith. The Church professes this mystery in the Apostles' Creed, which is part one of the Catechism, and celebrates it in the sacramental liturgy, which is part two of the Catechism, so that the life of the faithful may be conformed to Christ in the Holy Spirit to the glory of God the Father, which is part three. This mystery, then, requires that the faithful believe in it, that they celebrate it, and that they live from it in a vital and personal relationship with the living and true God. This vital and personal relationship with the living and true God is what we call prayer. Prayer is communion with the living God. The life that we live on earth, which we anticipate the life in heaven, is a life of communion. And pray God when all of us are in heaven, our life of prayer will cease, at least in the way that we experience it now. But at the heart, that's what prayer is. It's the life of communion with God. So the Catechism will say, generally speaking, that prayer is God's gift. Prayer is a covenant. And re we'll reflect on prayer as communion. So, the very desire that we have in us to pray is a, is a desire that's placed in us by God. Which is pretty awesome. That our existence is a search for God. A God who is already searching for us. That, that beautiful moment in Genesis when Adam and Eve are hiding, which is not the beautiful part of, uh, of the story, but God goes and says, where are you? That's what God is saying to us at every moment. Where are you? Here I am. I'm coming to search for you and place in you by your very created nature the desire to search for me. The scriptures will refer often to, uh, to the heart as the source of the person's life and the covenants that God makes with the chosen people in the Old Testament and the, 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 the final covenant, the, the ultimate covenant that uh, is made in Christ has its source in each of us in our heart. And for the Jews, the heart is the source of life. It's the source of being. It's where God dwells. And so the Catechism will talk frequently about the disposition of the heart as, as essential to communing with God in prayer. 
that God will dwell there. And that's where we meet him, is, is, is in the heart. All right? So, general introduction on prayer. The Catechism goes on to talk about prayer as a universal call that all people, Christian or otherwise, are called to be united to God. And then the, the, the Catechism will go on this just beautiful summation of salvation history, talking about Adam and Eve and their creation. Well, the, he, the, the Catechism will actually begin with the act of creation itself, God communicating his life into created things. In the, in the reality of the order of creation, in the reality of the beauty of creation, in the reality of the living growth of creation, in the harmony of created things with one another, and ultimately in the creation of man and woman, who he found very good. That God communicates his life as an essential um, characteristic of who he, who he is, that he communicates through the word, which will eventually become flesh. But in his very act of creation, he's communicating and making himself manifest in creation. And then in, in Adam and Eve, uh, that he calls everything into being, that he goes in search for Adam and says, where are you? And then, in a powerful way, the call of Abraham becomes this first example, this first understanding of the walk with God, the journey with God. And we see in Abraham, our father in faith, the disposition of receiving the word, of receiving the communication from God. The Catechism will say that Abraham's heart is submissive and attentive, two dispositions that are essential to prayer, that we are submissive and attentive and I tell my students all the time, and I tell Mr. Allstadt this all the time, and we talk about this all the time in the school, that my goal, above everything else in education, is to help the students learn to be attentive. And not just to me, although it's great when they are, but it's rare, but it's great, but attentive to creation, attentive to what they're reading, attentive to what they're hearing, Above all, attentive in prayer. Because if you can't be attentive in prayer, well, let me back up. If you can't be attentive at all, you can't be attentive in prayer. And if you can't be attentive in prayer, it's impossible to hear what the Lord might be speaking through the Holy Spirit. And so there goes prayer. So a really famous French philosopher, Simon Weil, says attentiveness is the goal of education because the goal of our lives is communion with God. And communion with God requires an attentiveness to what he is revealing. So submissiveness and attentiveness. These are the dispositions of Abraham's heart. And yet we see early on, foundational in in Abraham, in Jacob, is the struggle of prayer, this test of faith. All right, Abraham, a couple of things. First, I want you to leave all the people you know in this land where you are, and I want you to go to this place that I will show you at some point in the future. I'm going to show you. I just want you to go, and I'll show you where it is. Okay. And, uh, yeah, by the way, your wife's going to have to be your birthday. There and I'm out. We'll figure it out. Okay. I'm going to take your son and, and sacrifice. Okay. But Abraham questions. And, and Jacob wrestles with the angel. So there, there is, even at the foundational revelation of prayer, this struggle that, that God doesn't reveal everything, even though we, as the created, want it to be revealed. In Abraham, we also find promise and fulfillment. I tell my students all the time, we don't understand this anymore in our culture, but if you were a Jew, you, if you were one of the chosen people, the two things you wanted more than anything else were land and babies. That's what you wanted. Abraham had neither. God promised him both. 
promise fulfillment. And that is really the life of faith, which is cultivated in the life of prayer. That God has already made these promises, already promised to us everything. And we anticipate in the life of prayer their fulfillment. The already but not yet. That's a, kind of a, a popular theological understanding of salvation history. And already but not yet. We see that in the life of Abraham. We see it in Moses, uh, who is our first intercessor, our first example of intercessory prayer. Because God says, Moses, I want to talk with you, and, and I want you to pray on behalf of your people. And Moses is like, oh, get someone else. He's like, no. All right, fine, bring Aaron along for a while. But still, come up on the mountain with me. Take off your shoes. Cover your face, because it's all shiny, and the people aren't going to be able to, you're blinded. And I want you to speak with me, and then I want you to communicate what we've talked about to the people. So we have our first example of intercessory prayer in Moses, it, who is a foreshadower of the one intercessor between God and man, who is the man, Jesus Christ. God reveals himself to man in order to save him. We think of the example of, of Moses in the burning bush, the I am. And we hear in the scriptures that God speaks to Moses, and Moses speaks to God as though speaking to a friend, Exodus 33. So this beautiful intimacy is revealed already early on in the scriptures. So when people say, well, prayer is kind of like, you know, talking to a friend, that's not cliche, and it's not postmodern, and it's not, it's, it's not hip. Moses speaks with God as though he were speaking to a friend. We see prayers in sighs and the lamentations and the, the, the exaltations of the prophets who call God's people to a conversion of heart. And we'll talk a little bit later about the, the Christ exemplifying that and reiterating that, that the foundation of prayer is a conversion of heart. At times we see that the, that the prayers of the prophets are arguments, they're complaints, but they're awaiting what has been promised. They're awaiting and preparing for that intervention of God into time made manifest in the person of Jesus Christ. Then we come to what we could certainly say are, is the foundation of liturgical prayer. Probably the foundation of all forms of prayer, which is present to us in the Old Testament, and that's in the Psalms. And the incredible, things about, the incredible thing about the Psalms is that the Psalms speak both of God's words and of God's actions in history. And we shouldn't, we shouldn't overlook that reality, okay? The Greeks had great historians, okay? There's this guy, I can't remember his name or at least how to pronounce it, Theodocles or something like that, and he tells the history of the Peloponnesian War, and it's a history. These people did this, these people did this, they got in this boat, they went to this place, etc. You have also writers who speak of the pantheon of gods. They're mythical. They're not historical. But in the Psalms, we have both. We have an explanation of the historical reality of what God has done for his people, and we have the words of God himself. The Psalms uh, are, are called the praises. The Catechism says, in the Psalms, the word of God becomes the prayer of man. And the Catechism talks about how the Psalms are both deeply personal and communal. And that, in a nutshell, is our life of prayer as well. That there's nothing wrong with going off by oneself to pray. We see that example played out in the scriptures over and over and over again in Christ. But that Christ doesn't stay out there and says, I'm just spiritual, man. I'm not religious. The life of prayer is communal. That we are called to worship as a body. And the Psalms play that out over and over and over again. 
So I'm going to read 2588. I'm going to try and read it in a, in a very entertaining way because anytime anyone reads anything when they're giving a talk, I'm always like, <sighs> but still people do it. So uh, the praises, the psalms, many forms of prayer, they take shape both in the liturgy of the temple and in the human heart. Whether hymns or prayers of lamentation or thanksgiving, whether individual or communal, whether royal chants, songs of pilgrimage, or wisdom meditations, the Psalms are a mirror of God's marvelous deeds in the history of his people, as well as reflections of the human experiences of the psalmist. Though a given psalm may reflect an event of the past, it still possesses such direct simplicity that it can be prayed in truth by men of all times and conditions. And never truer words were spoken. The monks have prayed the psalms for centuries. The Liturgy of the Hours is this other liturgy of the church that many of you might be familiar with, but for those who aren't, it's a way of praying. It's, an, it's a regimented daily schedule of prayer that for some religious communities includes praying as many as nine times a day, for others seven. For diocesan priests, it's five times a day. Uh, and it includes different hours of the day. And the monks have been praying them for centuries. And they're praying them right now. And if you pray all of the hours of the day, within a few days, you've prayed all of the Psalms, all 150 of them. That's the life of the prayer, excuse me, that's the life of prayer lived out particularly in the Psalms. Now in the fullness of time, in the Word made flesh, any questions at this point? just rolling. I'm rolling along and I'm running out of time really fast. Where, yes, sir, please. Oh, man. So that will certainly be talk three. John Sr., who wrote a, uh, a number of great works, one that I love is called The Restoration of Christian Culture. At the very beginning he says, throw your television out the window and buy a piano. Nobody really takes that line very seriously. I don't think anyone takes Father Steve very seriously when he's like, get rid of your cell phone. People are like, okay, what he's saying is I shouldn't use my cell phone as much. Don't let your kids have iPads and, and monitors and screens. Well, I should reduce my screen time for my children from an hour to 20 minutes. No, he's saying smash them on the ground or at least sell them on eBay. We'll, we'll talk a lot about distractions because I think for everyone, no matter how long you've been praying, distractions are real. Sometimes they're our fault. Sometimes they're not. Sometimes it's a combination of the two. I love Therese because she talks about being distracted by one of the sisters whose rosary, praying, praying the rosary together. One of the sisters' rosaries is praying against the truth. And Therese talks about having this, she said, for a moment I had this called a sour thought or some kind of thought. I had this thought about my sister. And then quickly she was mortified, begged Jesus for forgiveness, and I was like, wow. Man, do I have a long way to go. <laughs> Therese gets distracted in prayer. Augustine talks about distractions in prayer. The only way to be free of them completely is to no longer be human. So there we are. But the disposition that we try to cultivate can't just happen in the church. And that's one, that's one thing that we'll talk about in, the, in, in, well, throughout, but certainly in the third talk. That, that if our lives are noisy everywhere else, we cannot possibly hope that our lives will be quiet in the church. We just can't. Our bodies, our, our human, we're, we're just too weak, or we just don't work that way. If you want silence in the church, you've got to have silence in your life, period. So, there's that. I know that's so uplifting, right? It's just hope-filled. I know. Throw the, throw the television out the window. Make sure there's no one below that. When you do throw it... In the fullness of time, the Catechism talks about 
how Christ prays, how he teaches prayer, and how he uh, how he passes on uh, passes on the tradition of prayer. Okay, so I'll cover those so, so, so cover those very quickly. The beautiful thing to think about Jesus learning prayer is that he learned he learned how to pray from his mom and, and his foster father. Isn't that so cool? Jesus learned how to pray from Mary and Joseph. And in this tiny little community in, in backwater Nazareth, in the synagogue, and in the temple in Jerusalem, Jesus was instructed how to pray in the home first. Now that should say something, obviously. Jesus prays in solitude. His prayers include all of humanity. No one escapes Jesus' prayer. We have two kind of explicit prayers, uh, spontaneous prayers of God recorded in the scriptures. One where he begins with thanksgiving. Uh, it's in Matthew 11, and he says, I thank you, Father, for you have hidden these things from the wise and the learned and revealed them to the little ones. And also when he raises Lazarus, he begins with thanksgiving. And he also implies a sort of constancy in prayer. He's like, God, I know that you hear me. I know that you always hear me. So there are dispositions in prayer based on Christ's prayer or, or the example of Christ praying is one of solitude. It's also one of constancy. But overarching, we see even in the infancy narratives when uh, Jesus is, is, is left behind and, they, and, and Mary and Joseph find him in the temple, he says, shouldn't you know or don't you know that I should be about my father's business? And so it's revealed in that moment the filial nature of prayer. That we are called in imitation of Christ to be sons and daughters praying to the father. And there's no way we could have known that without the incarnation. No way that we are called to be sons and daughters of God, we could have never known unless God revealed it to us. God searching for us first. And giving us the blueprint for what it means to be people of prayer. You also have the priestly prayer of Jesus. And then you have uh, the instructive part of Jesus' ministry, where he teaches how to pray. And this, is, this can be really sort of helpful practically for us. So first, Jesus insists on the conversion of heart. Prayer is not prayer if it's not transformative. So if you're ever wondering to yourself, how's my prayer going? You should ask people who you trust, who you love, if you are changing. And if you're not, Prayer's not going very well. Now, there are a lot of reasons why it might not be going well. Some of it's our fault. Some of it's not. But even if it's not our fault, most of the time it's our problem. Which we, so we've we got to deal with it. But conversion of heart is, is the prerequisite. We have to repent first. So it's a good measure for our own. What does repenting look like? What does conversion of heart look like? Reconciliation with our brothers and sisters, the love of our enemies, prayers for those who persecute us, prayer in secret, so not heaping up empty phrases. Jesus doesn't have very kind things to say about that. Prayerful forgiveness, purity of heart, Matthew 5, 8, and seeking the kingdom before all else. All of those things are incredibly difficult to do. But it's the, it's the desire for metanoia, the desire for the turning around, that is a disposition that's absolutely fundamental. And all of you are here, so I'm sure all of you are there in that regard. Now, once we're committed to conversion, and this was my own experience too. Okay, once I'm committed to conversion, now the heart learns how to pray in faith. And Jesus talks about 
having a filial boldness. He says more than once, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe you'll get it and you will. The hearts are committed to the conversion. Communion with God. The secret in the kingdom among all things. Then more than likely, the things that we pray for in boldness, God will be willing to grant. Because we're not praying that we triumph over our enemies and crush their heads as we, as we step over them. We're praying for humility. We're praying for peace. We're praying for our loved ones, that they will find Christ or return to the church. But always remembering that we're on His time. Prayer disposes our hearts, and I love the Catechism's words on this, it disposes our hearts to do the will of the Father. And this is the essential posture which we all must take. That our hearts are disposed to do the Father's will. When I was a seminarian, we had this prayer. It's pretty straightforward and simple. Lord, help me to be what you want me to be. And then help me to want to be what you want me to be. That prayer disposes us to ask for the things in prayer that many times God wants us to have in the first place. One other disposition that Jesus talks about often uh, in teaching us how to pray is the, the disposition of vigilance, of watchfulness. So that's the throwing the TV out the window, that's turning off the, the, the radio in the car. Uh, it's, it's a vigilance because you never know when the lightning of the Spirit is going to strike. A whisper, as a lot of people, uh, teaches us. The greatest example of prayer in the New Testament, uh, other than Christ Himself, is the prayer of the Virgin Mary, who gives her entire being over to the will of the Father. She gives her heart and contemplates the words of her heart. I love it. Mary kept all these things in her mind. She gives her mind. The little piece of thing. Hmm, what should we do? Jesus? And she gives her body. So we're going to talk about things like you better have slept well. There's not great if you don't sleep. Uh, I'm a huge advocate of drinking coffee before you pray. And I'm not the first. The monks do it. The sisters do it. Fulton Sheen says, there's no point in praying if you haven't had coffee. <laughs> What's the point? I mean, he used to pray at 5.30 in the morning, so that stands to reason. But the body has to be just as attentive, right? It has to be just as attentive. Otherwise, forget about it. Forget about it. So we see, moving quickly forward and ahead, this is going great. Don't you all think this is, I mean, I think, wow. Okay, I'm really moved. I'm so glad I recorded this so I can watch it later. <laughs> in the age of the church or the age of the spirit, we see in Acts, especially in Acts chapter 2, the life of prayer lived out in the early church. The apostles devoted themselves, excuse me, the, 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 the followers of Christ devoted themselves to the a teaching of the apostles, to fellowship, to the breaking of the bread, and the prayers. That encapsulates the life of prayer of the early church, that it's founded on apostolic faith, okay, so we don't, we don't just make up ways of praying that aren't connected to the apostolic foundations of the faith. Our prayer is authenticated by charity. So the life of the works of mercy, both corporal and spiritual, are, they authenticate our life of prayer because we're moved in prayer to love our neighbor, even as we love God more and more. That's a great thing. The more you love God, the more you love your neighbor. God's good like that. And our prayer is nourished in the Eucharist. And we'll talk a lot about the liturgy, how it is the highest form of prayer. It's the source of prayer. It's the source and summit of the Christian life. And it's the plan and purpose of evangelization. In the age of the church, in the age of the Spirit, which is where we all live, we are nourished by the Spirit who teaches, guides, and keeps the memory of Christ alive. Leads the church to new formulations and expressions of the unfathomable mystery of Christ at work in the church's life, sacraments, and mission. 
so there can be new formulations of prayer, a kind of development of prayer, but always rooted, radical, that's, that's the root of the word rooted, radical, in the life of the apostolic church. Very briefly, the Catechism will talk about the forms of prayer. And uh, the, the Catechism gives a little bit of a different instruction uh, from the one that, uh, that, that I would normally teach, but th it discusses very generally the ways in which the Church prays. Uh, there, there's a form of blessing and adoration, there's a form of petition, there's the form of intercession, there is the form of, um, where am I? Five, six, seven. Uh, the form of adoration, adoration, contrition, thanksgiving, and supplication. That's ACTS. There we are. Um, and so the, 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 at the end of the first chapter of the, the life of prayer in the church, in the catechism, these forms of prayers are elaborated a little bit. So I'll, just, I'll talk briefly about them, and then we'll have maybe 10 minutes or so for questions or comments, etc. So the, the catechism begins with the prayer of blessing and adoration that, in fact, blessing is a kind of dialogue, that the Lord blesses us with his gifts, and in response, we bless God for blessing us. God's blessing descends upon us, and our prayers of blessing ascend to God. The, the prayer of adoration is, is one that shows our relationship to God as creature, that, that God is the source of all being, the source of all existence, the source of our life, that he holds us in existence by thinking about us and by loving us. And in adoration, we recognize, God, you are you. You are God. Nothing else. It's not, it's not thank you for this. It's not please help me with this. It's not, I don't know what to do about this. It's, you are God. You are everything. The prayer, of the, the prayer of petition begins by asking the Lord for forgiveness. And saying, Lord, I don't love you as much as I should. Help me. Now, the beautiful thing about prayer of petition in the New Testament is that it's buoyed, as the Catechism says, by hope. Because we know the end of the story. And we're striving to live out the story in anticipation of the end, where Christ is all in all. So we pray for the coming of the kingdom, which is kind of a scary prayer. We pray it all the time. Thy kingdom come. Woo! We go to confession first, then thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So we pray for the coming of the kingdom, and then we pray that we participate and prepare for the thing that we just prayed for. Lord, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So we're praying that the kingdom comes and we're praying that, Lord, help, help me and help our community be the kind of people and be about the kind of things so that we can cooperate with the coming of the kingdom. Then we have the prayer of intercession, a prayer of asking on behalf of another. Uh, it's a kind of prayer that's attuned to God's mercy when we pray for others rather than ourselves. And it also, uh, it, it, uh, it's a way of participating in the intercessory prayer of Christ, who prays for all of those. He prays for the little ones. He prays that, uh, that Peter might, might rise up and, and comfort and guide the apostles. He prays from the cross, forgive them for they know not what they do. So we, we participate in Christ's intercessory prayer when we pray the prayer of intercession. And finally, in Thanksgiving, characterizes the prayer of the church, says the Catechism, in celebrating the Eucharist and reveals and becomes, so that the church reveals and becomes more of who she is. Every event, every need, is an exercise in gratitude. Every event. And it's so hard for us to think about that, but Paul says, we should give thanks in all circumstances. That's the prayer of thanksgiving. That's the Eucharistia. And finally, the prayer of praise 
Uh, it's the praise uh, in the form of prayer which recognizes most immediately that God is God. Now, when I teach prayer, I teach the ACTS when I teach my students, especially when they're praying extemporaneously. Adoration, contrition, thanksgiving, supplication. So I don't know if you remember my prayer from the beginning, but it was something like this. Good and gracious God, we give you glory and praise. We love you. You're awesome. Lord, sorry we're horrible sinners. Will you please forgive us? Um, Lord, we ask you to be with us. And, oh, I'm sorry. We thank you for being awesome. And we ask you to be with us and help us to be awesome too. Adoration, contrition, thanksgiving, supplication. So, in, in, in sum, I'll just say this. When we look to the life of God in our own lives, and, and, and we try to think to ourselves, what, what does prayer look like? And we'll talk more about the practical questions and, and how communities pray and different ways of prayer and all that sort of thing. We have in the patrimony of the church life that's lived out in the, the chosen people, in the fullness of time in Christ, in the life of the church, we have all of these great examples of prayer. So it ought not be foreign to us, or think that we have to find it somewhere out there, but it's present to us, and, and, and we have such rich sources in the church to guide us. So certainly want to encourage all of you in your life to prepare for this Advent, and uh, I hope that that as we, if we talk over the next couple of weeks, if you have questions, if things come up, uh, that we can discuss those as well. So a few minutes left, I think, if we have, uh, if, if anyone has any particular questions or comments or accolades or exaltations. There's nothing left to say, Brian. It's just, uh, <laughs> oh, thanks, Robert. No? Yes, yes. Right. 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 That's good. Right. Right. So for those who might not have heard the question, when you're meditating, which is a kind of mental prayer, you're reflecting out of the life of Christ, of the scriptures, of the rosary, uh, and it's requiring intellectual activity. Is there a distinction between thinking and praying? And do you know when you're thinking, do you know when you're praying? Yes, it would be better left for the third talk, but briefly, The crazy thing about prayer, and I'll just speak for my own life, is that, well, I'll tell you what, what, what the rector of the seminary said, and it's, it's, been, it's been my salvation regarding prayer. One of the seminarians said, said Monsignor, how do you know if your prayer is good? He said, good prayer is faithful. That's the only measure. That's the only measure. Good prayer is faith. Are you praying? Thank you. Have you committed to a life of prayer every single day? And you don't budge from that. And you don't depart from that. He said, whatever happens in prayer will happen in prayer. And there are a lot of things that are that will be helpful and a lot of things that will be harmful. So if you're tired or if you're sick or if you just had a powerful retreat experience or if there's dryness in prayer or if there's darkness in prayer or if there's jubilation in prayer and sometimes you just sit in there and you sit down and you, you think 10 minutes has gone by and it's been an hour because the Lord has just given it. Oh, just pouring it on, right? And other times, uh, you know, it's like sitting down to talk with finances with your wife. 
And you're like, oh, for crying out loud, do we have to have this monthly budget meeting? Seriously? I mean, we're doing pretty well. I didn't, I, 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 just, I didn't buy anything I wasn't supposed to, and you didn't either, and so things, oh, but we need to do it. Okay, fine, I'm here. Right. Is that a good example? I'm sorry, dear. I'm going to cut that out of the video. <laughs> Sometimes it feels like thinking. Sometimes uh, the thinking is directed by some word or some image. And I find that I pause on that thing. And if I'm just thinking about that thing, I probably wouldn't pause because I, we think in kind of a narrative. But I pause. And, and, and that pause might direct me to something else. And, uh, you know, it, it's a kind of listening in a way. But mental prayer is mental. Right? Th Thomas Aquinas, who's the best, <clears throat> says that, that prayer is an intellectual activity. It is. And then our reason is always engaged, even when it's superseded. That's what I think is really cool. Our, our intellect is always engaged, even when God overwhelms the reason by his love. It's never not active. So, but we can talk more about that because, because we'll talk about meditation and we'll, we'll talk about... Uh, and Father Steve is actually going to go into a pretty elaborate discussion of the different ways of prayer and the different forms of prayer. But uh, that's a short answer. So, for, and that's for everyone. Good prayer is faithful prayer. Don't worry about how it goes while you're there. Just worry about being there every day. Yeah. All right? Okay, 8 o'clock, right on time. Well, thank you very much. Uh, if you have any other further questions, I'll be meandering about. And I hope you will invite more people. Uh, unless you thought it was horrible, then don't invite anyone. But at least come back so I don't feel bad when there are fewer people here next week than there were today. Let's end in prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Remember, O most gracious Virgin Mary, that never was it known that anyone who fled to thy protection, implored thy help, or sought thy intercession was left unaided. Inspired by this confidence, I fly unto thee, O Virgin of virgins, my mother. To thee do I come, before thee I stand, sinful and sorrowful. O Mother of the Word incarnate, despise not my petitions, but in thy mercy hear and answer me. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.